Good afternoon and welcome to Morrison Planetarium's Facebook page and the YouTube, I'm sorry, uh, the Open Space YouTube channel. My name is Ryan Wyatt. I'm the Senior Director of Morrison Planetarium and Science Visualization at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. And I'll be your host for today as a virtual tour of outer space. This is a weekly program we do to take you around uh, the universe, show you a few things, uh, and maybe visit a few places that you're interested in going to. If you have some places you'd like to go, you can drop them in chat if you have questions that come up. You can also put those in chat. I'll be piloting and talking to you a little bit about uh, the things you're looking at. Uh, and um, we'll actually start out pretty close to home and work our way out very, very far from home. So our initial view here is of the International Space Station. This is kind of as far as humans actually travel out into space these days. Uh, if you can imagine, it's about the size of a football field uh, from one end to the other, the close end kind of uh, here near us to the far end is about a football field. Uh, and there are people on, on, uh, on board. Uh, so uh, I've recently been fond of pointing out that in fact, uh, I went to grad school with one of the astronauts, Shannon Walker, a uh, remarkable uh, person and amazing astronaut. Uh, she graduated, went on to work for NASA and is now on board the International Space Station. Um, and here I am talking to you on Facebook and YouTube. I guess you can decide who got the better end of the deal, but at least I get to go out to eat on weekends. Anyway, uh, the International Space Station, if you can imagine the, the little uh, modules here are where the astronauts are. So if you can imagine, this is kind of a human scaled object. And that's kind of good for a starting point because in fact, we're gonna travel very far from home. We're gonna look at places that are very different from Earth, much, much bigger and stranger. And so it'll be helpful to have this kind of as a grounding starting point. Now, the International Space Station orbits Earth, and it orbits just a few hundred kilometers, a few hundred miles uh, above uh, our planet's surface. And as I said, this is as far as humans go into space uh, these days. But what's great is that we're not really confined by uh, how far our rockets can take us. We instead, what we'll be doing is traveling through kind of a virtual model of the universe. Uh, and what I'll do here is I'll pull away from our, uh, our model of the International Space Station. It kind of looks like it's plummeting into the ocean. I guarantee you that's not what's happening. It's just that we're pulling away from Earth. So we're now traveling uh, thousands of kilometers per hour, basically, pulling away from Earth. And now you can see that, in fact, we were uh, just over the Kamchatka Peninsula uh, and the, the International Space Station uh, is flying north of Japan. And actually, this is the International Space Station where it will be uh, in uh, in about 45, 50 minutes. Because uh, I wanted it in daylight hours, so I wanted to show you a um, uh, daylit International Space Station. Now, you'll notice that our image of Earth is a little, um, I would say, wonky. Um, you'll notice that there are big kind of slices taken out here. Now, this is a good point to, a, a good point in the program to to mention that in fact the model of the universe that we're showing here is driven by data and so what we're showing you is not just an artist representation but we're actually doing something that's really driven uh, by putting multiple layers of data into this software called open space software that's one of the reasons we're streaming to the open space youtube channel um, if you're interested in the open space software we'll be sharing a link to where you can download it you can take this kind of tour of the universe yourself. Uh, and we'll also actually be um, posting for a survey later in the program as well uh, to find out what you think, because this project, the Open Space Project, is funded by NASA, and we're curious to learn how people think about using the software. So you might think, well, wow, software that just shows a big blue void, or in fact, you know that, well, actually, that is the Pacific Ocean, so it is kind of a blue void on our planet. Uh, but what's happening here is that the software brings in the latest data from uh, Earth orbiting satellites and maps those onto the sphere of Earth. Now, because I didn't fine tune this before I started, I could have turned back the clock a full day so that we would have had a day's worth of imagery covering Earth. Instead, uh, we're seeing the kind of limits of uh, the, the data that have been time stamped for today's date, uh, April 21st. And so you'll see that half of Earth here, really more than that, because we're, we're seeing I uh, just happen to be seeing this part that hasn't been uh, been covered by observations. Uh, but the lower half is sort of covered by data because we have data uh, less than 24 hours old 
for that part of the globe. But in fact, um, if we were to look at Earth from space, uh, we would have looked just a little less than a day ago, this is really what it would have looked like uh, from space. And that's one of the cool things about open space software. It gives you a sense of how Earth is changing over the course of time, uh, not just uh, kind of a representation of our globe. Well, as we pull farther away from home, I just want to mention that, uh, as I said before, astronauts only travel a few hundred kilometers above Earth's surface these days. But about 50 years ago, uh, humans did travel uh, a bit farther. And I can actually show you the uh, orbit of Earth's moon here. You can see the sun in the lower part of the image. This is Earth's orbit around the sun, this kind of line extending off to the right. The orbit of the moon around Earth is seen here and the moon's location uh, over here. Now, if you want to think about that, that's as far as humans have ever traveled into space. Today, we only travel a few hundred kilometers. About 50 years ago, uh, 12 lucky guys got to make the trip. Uh, it was um, it's about 240,000 miles from Earth to the moon. It was a four-day trip. And what's kind of amazing is that although it took our rockets and our spacecraft four days, three or four days to make it there, uh, in fact, light travels that same distance in just a second and a half. Light travels at a constant velocity of about 186,000 miles per second or about 300,000 kilometers per second. So for the 240,000 miles or 400,000 kilometers between Earth and the moon, it takes about a second and a half for light to traverse that distance. Now, if you think about it, that's a little bit like maybe a pause in conversation, uh, the time that it takes for light to travel from the moon to Earth. So when you look at the full moon in the sky, you're seeing it as it was about a second and a half ago. Now, from Earth to the sun, because we just traveled much farther uh, from home, it's a bit farther. It's more like 150,000 kilometers, 93, I'm sorry, 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles, and it takes light a bit longer to traverse that distance. It's about uh, eight and a half minutes from Earth to the sun in terms of light travel time. So you might think of that as like, um, if you really eat your lunch pretty quickly, it might be eight and a half minutes. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's a quick lunch maybe from Earth to the sun in terms of light travel time. Now, if we talk about our solar system, uh, the distance across Neptune's orbit, uh, so in down here, close to the, to the sun, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, the terrestrial planets huddled close to the light and heat of the sun. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, those four planets are the giant planets in our solar system, and they are uh, a lot farther from the sun. Neptune's orbit is a little less than eight light hours across, so it takes light about eight hours to go from one side of Earth's orbit, or from one side of Neptune's orbit, to the other. And that means that you can think of that as maybe a good night's sleep from one side of the solar system to the other. Now, what's really a mind-blowing is that the distance from the sun, or really any place in the solar system, to the nearest star, and so all of the stars in the background here, for example, the stars of the Big Dipper that are kind of crossing behind uh, our representation of our, uh, our solar system. All of these stars are much, much farther away. The closest of these, the very closest, is about four light years away. So if it's a good night's sleep in terms of light travel time across our solar system, then it's more like a high school or college education to get to the nearest star. And we saw Orion a little bit earlier here, it is the constellation is upside down. Uh, there's a V shape here that's the uh, face of Taurus the Bull. This is a cluster of stars called the Hyades in the star Aldebaran. Uh, and just for comparison, and I'll try to point these out as we get farther from home, uh, Aldebaran is about, give or take, 60 some odd light years away. Uh, the stars in the Hyades are 150 some odd. And this little cluster of stars, the Seven Sisters or Pleiades, is about 250 light years away. So these are much, much farther away in terms of light travel time, this kind of cosmic yardstick we use of light years or the distance light travels in a year, much farther away than our closest star, which is a mere four light years away. 
But these are the kind of distances astronomers have to deal with, we have to think about. And these are the challenges that we have when we start not only to imagine what the universe looks like around us, but also the challenge of exploring the universe around us. So you might think, well, we've sent spacecraft to visit various uh, planets in our solar system, and I haven't seen any requests to visit planets. So let me just actually, I kind of, I like our solar system. I especially like Earth, but I do also like getting away from uh, our solar system. So let me just point out quickly the trajectories of five very special spacecraft that have traveled through our solar system. Now, all of these have left from Earth, so you can see all of their trajectories start from Earth and then head out from there. The, um, uh, the trajectories here show how far the spacecraft have traveled in, since they've been launched and kind of their current positions right now. Uh, the one that's heading kind of straight out of the solar system is the New Horizons spacecraft that visited Pluto back in 2015. Uh, and oh, we have a request to see Pluto, so that's perfect timing. Um, so the New Horizons spacecraft just crossed a milestone. It's 50 times as far away from the sun as Earth is. So given our request to uh, take a look at Pluto, let me see if I can get us there. Now, I mentioned that we have the orbits of the eight planets. Pluto, as some of you may know, got reclassified from being considered a planet to uh, being, a, uh, con being classified as a dwarf planet. But let me go ahead and take us there because no matter what you call Pluto, it's still a very special place and a very amazing discovery made, set of discoveries really, made by the New Horizons spacecraft have revealed Pluto to be something extraordinarily special. So let me go ahead and get us close to uh, Pluto here. And um, let's see here, it seemed to be a little frozen. Um, and you might expect, because Pluto resides most of its most of the time, even farther from the sun than um, hold on a second, than uh, than Neptune, the farthest planet. I'm just kind of tweaking this off here to make sure that we can see Pluto. Um, that uh, it's a pretty cold place, far from the light and heat of the sun, and it is. Um, not showing up. Oh, here we are, finally. Oh, wow, sorry. Um, I, was, uh, I was too impatient. So here we have Pluto appearing uh, as we get closer to it. So you might expect this is very, very far away from light and the heat of the sun. And, and honestly, even planetary astronomers, the people who study uh, objects in the solar system kind of thought maybe Pluto would not be a super interesting place. And yet, as you can see here, we have Pluto in the foreground in the distance, it's relatively giant moon Charon. It's, a, it's a, a quite a bit larger compared to uh, Pluto than most moons of other planets. Uh, but Pluto turned out to be this fascinating place in our solar system. Uh, you can kind of see this giant pale heart shape uh, on, the, on the surface of, of Pluto. That's actually, it's not really an ocean, but it is a uh, you might think of it as sort of an ocean of toothpaste. This is frozen nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is a gas in Earth's atmosphere, but this far from the sun, away from the light and heat of the sun, the, uh, the nitrogen freezes into this kind of sort of toothpaste-y consistency, and ice becomes rock hard. So many of the mountains that you see here, and what is incredible about Pluto is that it has this varied terrain uh, with uh, remarkable mountains, some craters, and then if we, as we turn around here to see this kind of um, toothpastey terrain, you'll notice that there aren't really a lot of craters. And that actually suggests, I mean, not only if you can imagine an impact that would create a crater in a hard rocky material might not make such a big dent in something like toothpaste, but also that this surface is much younger uh, than the rest of, the, of the, the dwarf planet Pluto. So Pluto is this phenomenally interesting object 
explored by the New Horizons spacecraft, which sent back uh, the imagery and data that were turned into our three-dimensional map of uh, the dwarf planet. And unfortunately, we'll have no opportunity anytime soon to visit Pluto again because New Horizons had to zip by and continued on its way out of the solar system. Uh, but um, it's uh, certainly an amazing opportunity to learn about this sort of surprising and fantastic place at the outer part of our solar system. So um, let me actually go ahead. I kind of zipped away a little too far there. Uh, let me go ahead and bring back up our some of the trajectories I was showing you earlier, the uh, trajectories of the various spacecraft that uh, we have sent out to explore the solar system. Uh, I already mentioned the New Horizons spacecraft here, that trajectory that's kind of zipping out uh, into, uh, into the distance there. But there was also the uh, Voyagers 1 and 2 space, oops, sorry, 2 spacecraft, uh, and the Pioneer 1011 spacecraft. All of those spacecraft were launched back in the 1970s. New Horizons was launched in the early aughts. And what's kind of cool is when you look at this, you can see that although um, Voyagers 1 and 2 in particular have traveled quite far from home, they still haven't traveled as far as light can travel in a single day. So uh, remember that the diameter of Neptune's orbit here is about eight light hours. So if you think of that as a good night's sleep, then you'll notice that none of the spacecraft, these fastest kind of nuts and bolts objects we've ever sent into space, none of them has traveled as far as light would travel in about 24 hours. So if you think about these as like our emissaries out into space, they haven't really made it that far. And this is the only part of the universe that we've kind of explored, not really in person, but at least being able to send our kind of robot explorers out to check out planets. That's as far as they've gotten. And then what's really cool is that we figured out a lot of the rest of what I'm gonna talk about based on observations just of light. So by looking at the light from these mini stars, uh, we can actually figure out what they're made of, figure out that they have planets in orbit around them, and then even looking beyond that, we can figure out that there are whole cities and collections of stars that are much, much farther from home. So we've now vastly exceeded the speed of light. We've broken it, uh, broken that uh, speed limit many times over. We pulled away far enough so that we're actually seeing as we kind of continue to sort of virtually orbit the sun, we're seeing that some of the stars have shifted out of their familiar constellations and that we're seeing these uh, in three dimensions. We're seeing that some of these stars that we see in our night sky are closer by, some of them are farther away, uh, but we're able to make observations and figure out, as I mentioned before, that some of these actually have planets in orbit around them. So when we look at these stars, what we see is the bright, hot center of these planetary systems. But by studying the starlight, we can figure out that many of these stars, in fact, statistically, we think we can say that most stars have planets in orbit around them, and many of them probably have Earth-sized planets in orbit around them. Each one of these circles represents a planetary system we may only have one planet that we found, may have more, but each circle uh, is uh, a designator for a star that has a planet or more, one, one or more planets or orbit around it. And we found thousands of these so-called exoplanets, thousands of these planets uh, in orbit around their parent stars. And you can see here, actually, uh, you may have been, remembered I mentioned the Hyades cluster of stars. It's actually the Hyades right here. Uh, this is a collection of stars that uh, were born together. They're kind of like teenage stars. They're born together. They're continuing to live together, um, but they all reside at kind of the same distance from where we are in the center of this three-dimensional picture um, because they're still kind of grouped together um, in the cluster in which they were born. So in the same way that I mentioned that we have the nuts and bolts spacecraft that we've sent out into, into the universe that have explored our solar system, we've also been sending out radio waves, which are a form of light, that would kind of 
signal to an intelligent extraterrestrial observer that there's intelligent life, as far as they can tell, here on Earth. So sometimes what we call the radio sphere is a sphere about, um, give or take, about 80 light years in radius. That's the amount of time that we have been broadcasting radio waves strong enough to escape Earth's ionosphere. So it turns out that your AM radio is going to bounce around inside Earth's atmosphere. It's not going to escape. But television signals, at least the carrier waves, radar. And back in the day when we were kind of silly enough to be exploding nuclear warheads above Earth's surface, those all events all create radiation. Radar, television, nuclear explosions all create bursts of radio emission that can escape our ionosphere, part of our atmosphere, and potentially be detected uh, outside our system. Now, you can think of this sphere then, centered on Earth, about 80 light years in, in radius, as Earth's kind of, or our civilization's kind of electromagnetic footprint in the universe around us. So the same way that those Voyager and Pioneer and New Horizons spacecraft represented the farthest our nuts and bolts technology has traveled out into space, this is the farthest that we have made our presence known using light. And in that sense, it's like our, our kind of electromagnetic footprint, electromagnetic radiation being light, electromagnetic footprint in the universe around us. And then you can imagine that if uh, I mentioned intelligent aliens looking back at Earth, if they were residing on one of the planets inside the sphere, they could point their radio telescope back at Earth and potentially detect something. But even if you had an intelligent alien on like this planet over here, or one of these over here, or any of these planets outside of that radio sphere, they wouldn't even know that we exist, or at least not that our technology exists, because the radio signals haven't had time to reach them. So this sphere is actually expanding at the rate of one light year per year because it is light traveling out into the universe. So eventually this radius field will wash over all of these planets in our galaxy, all of these potential alien astronomers, but it'll take time and the signal will grow weaker as the sphere expands. So it's just kind of an interesting thought looking at our system from the outside, uh, what that kind of represents for uh, humanity's place in the universe. So to put this now in a little bit greater context, let's keep pulling away from our planetary system. And I haven't really pointed out this kind of hazy, blotchy structure in the background, but that's our Milky Way galaxy. Now, the thousands of stars that you can see on a clear dark night from uh, from someplace on Earth are all part of our Milky Way galaxy. It's, uh, let me just pull around from a different angle here. The light of the hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy simply kind of smears together to form this hazy band that crosses through our sky. So, the thousands of stars that we see as pinpoints of light are relatively close by, but the billions of stars that are farther away are so far away that they kind of blur together to form the Milky Way in Earth's sky. And now what we're seeing is not the Milky Way as seen from Earth, but the Milky Way as seen from a kind of imaginary vantage point far, far away from home. That radiosphere, if you remember the 80 light year radius sphere centered on Earth. That's kind of our, again, our technological footprint in the universe around us. That's just a few pixels on our image now. And for comparison, we reside about 35-ish thousand light years from the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So light from the center of the galaxy takes about 35,000 years to reach us here on Earth. And if you think about what humans were doing 35,000 years ago, well, we were painting the insides of caves. So now 
that light travel time that I introduced as the second and a half from Earth to the moon, eight minutes, eight and a half minutes from the sun to Earth, four light years, four years from the Earth, from the sun to the nearest star. Now, in terms of light travel time, we're talking about 100,000 years, give or take, across the diameter of our Milky Way galaxy, our home of hundreds of billions of stars. And again, our footprint in the universe is that tiny little dot on the outer perimeter of the Milky Way galaxy. What's even more mind-boggling is actually that if we pull a farther away here, we'll start to fade up some additional points representing, actually I'll just mention here, we have the large and small Magellanic clouds. These are look a little flat the way we're showing them here, but these are actually uh, uh, two satellite galaxies of our own home Milky Way galaxy. Uh, but now we're gonna fade up little points in the distance, each one of which represents an individual galaxy with perhaps just as many stars or more than our Milky Way galaxy. Hundreds of billions, perhaps even a trillion stars in terms of the, the largest of these galaxies. So every dot now represents hundreds of billions or perhaps trillions of stars. And again, we've made this map by studying the light traveling from these distant places. And we can figure out how far away they are. We can kind of figure out what type of galaxy they are in many cases. And we actually have whole projects, some of them are citizen science projects, you can log in and help classify, help astronomers classify um, astronomers. And, uh, um, uh, sorry, I was looking at one of the questions that popped up. We've traveled outside our galaxy now, but someone was asking about uh, what planets have life on them. But it's kind of an interesting question as we look at um, this kind of big picture. We've now left our galaxy behind. All of the planets that we know of orbiting other stars are part of our own home galaxy way down here. And although we know of thousands of those planets, again, all part of this small or the collection of points in the middle of our image, we don't know of any of them that have life. The only example of life that we have in the universe is our own home planet Earth. And it's an interesting thought to keep in mind as we travel farther and farther from home because I'm going to continue to kind of pull away from our location on Earth, our location around the sun in our solar system, our location in our Milky Way galaxy. And as we do, we're going to bring up more and more of these individual points that represent individual galaxies, uh, including you can see clusters of galaxies here. And an important point is that galaxies, kind of like stars are born in clusters, like the Hyades cluster I pointed out earlier, galaxies also kind of... Um, cluster together. Uh, we have a great question about our galaxy colliding with another galaxy. And um, I'll mention that, that although stars are really widely separated compared to their size, galaxies are a little more tightly packed. And in fact, in the, the Virgo cluster here, um, it's about a thousand galaxies crammed into a relatively tight space. Um, but let's go back in toward our own Milky Way. Um, and let me see if I can show you not just the Milky Way, but our nearest sort of significantly sized companion, uh, the Andromeda galaxy. So I'm not seeing Andromeda here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that must be here. Nope, those are the uh, large and small Magellanic clouds. All these dots are starting to confuse me. Well, there's a question was about a collision with another galaxy. Uh, I'm getting my bearings here. And in fact, Although we don't live in a tightly kind of crowded um, galactic environment like the, uh, uh, the Virgo cluster, we, we live in more of a loosely bound group called the local group of galaxies. Um, so it's more like a big clubhouse than a town or a city. There's about 50 members of the local group and I just can't for the life of me find the other kind of big player in the local group. Uh, but there's a galaxy about the same size, a little bit larger probably than our own Milky Way, another galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars in it, called the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, it's about two million light years away from our own Milky Way. Uh, so it's kind of, um, let me just pull far enough away to see if I can get a glimpse of it. Um, so it's about two million light years away. And we are on a collision course. So the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy will eventually collide. Now, 
that may happen eh, three to five billion years from now. That's a billion with a B. So it's not happening anytime soon. But eventually, and the question there is whether, um, th so that the, the two galaxies are kind of moving toward each other. If we're on a kind of a head-on course, it'll be like three million years, three billion years before we collide. Um, but if it's if we're a little off, then it, then it, then we'll kind of have a near miss in three billion years, and then it'll take another two billion years for gravity to pull us back in together, and then eventually collide. So. Um, in something like three to five billion years, the uh, the two galaxies will collide. I, I'm sorry, I just can't find uh, uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy here in our collection. Oh, there it is. Of course, now I find it as soon as I say I can't find it. So the Andromeda galaxy is here, the Milky Way here. That is um, uh, about two million light years separating us. The two galaxies are headed toward each other roughly. And in, in three billion years, will kind of meet in the center uh, and the two galaxies will collide. Again, we're sort of about the same size. Um, in that collision, we see lots of galaxies and all of these points of light don't really, or points that we see on the screen here, don't really kind of convey how individual and distinct and complex each one of these galaxies is. But we actually see lots of examples of galaxies colliding and in fact, in the history of the Milky Way, it's probably experienced collisions with smaller galaxies. But this head-on collision with our local Andromeda galaxy uh, is a much, much different phenomenon. And in that collision, which will take millions of years to kind of transpire, in fact, over for the whole duration, billions of years, um, the, the two galaxies will sort of merge together and form one larger galaxy. Individual stars will almost certainly not collide, but uh, the um, the two galaxies will form one larger one. So um, we're kind of coming up on the hour here. So let me actually just kind of start to get out to our big picture before bringing you home. And that is uh, now we're seeing more and more of these points, each one again, representing an individual galaxy with hundreds of millions, perhaps hundreds of billions, perhaps a trillion stars each. So each one of these points is a complex, amazing galaxy in its own right. Some of them are probably colliding um, but what we're looking at here is a way of kind of getting a sense of what we call a large scale structure of the universe. And we kind of mentioned earlier that galaxies kind of clump together and it looks like they stretch out as well. And they stretch out in a kind of creepy way that suggests that they're all sort of pointing back to our location on earth. And that would be a little um, distressing thinking that the entire universe was kind of looking back at us and kind of, kind of, um, angled toward us, but in fact, it's because the way we observe these clusters of galaxies, um, there's a slight uncertainty in their distances for various reasons. And because of that, the clumps, which would readily be kind of tight clusters of galaxies, kind of uh, the way we're depicting the actual data here, again, we're showing real data, uh, they appear to sort of stretch out in what we uh, affectionately call fingers of God that uh, sort of point back to the place where the observation is being made uh, back toward our home uh, on Earth in the Milky Way galaxy at the center of this image. Now, I want to turn around here because what's a little deceptive is that although we definitely see this like clumping and clustering of galaxies, you can also see some other things that are a little potentially Actually, it kind of looks like my software has crashed, but I think we're back to normal here. Uh, kind of looks like there's a big slice taken out and that there are no galaxies sort of up here or down here. But in fact, that's just because of the way we're observing uh, the universe. We haven't cataloged the entire universe. In fact, these kind of uh, big fan-shaped swaths of detailed galaxy positions that we see um, in portions of the of the three-dimensional data that we're looking at here, those are just happen to be well cataloged, well studied parts of the sky. But it's not that there are no galaxies here or here. It's just that those are parts of the universe we haven't gotten around to mapping yet or haven't completed mapping yet. And I just want to pull far enough away to kind of get to the punchline here because I mentioned at the very beginning of this the sense of light travel time. So the fact that 
when we look out into space, whether we're looking at something as close as the moon, uh, light takes time to reach us. So when we look at the moon, we're seeing it as it was for a second and a half ago. When we look at the sun, we're seeing light from the sun as it was emitted eight and a half minutes ago. Light takes time to travel across these vast distances. And now we've traveled so far out into the universe that light takes billions of years to travel from these galaxies uh, to our location here at the center of all this. And the punchline is that if we travel far enough, and here these individual points are not even galaxies so much as the bright cores of very young galaxies, what we see is a kind of baby picture of the universe. Light that it was emitted, it's the oldest light that we can observe light that was emitted when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. The universe is now about 13.8 billion years old. So this light is very old indeed. And you'll notice that the kind of baby picture of the universe has a kind of mottled appearance. There are blotchy brighter regions, blotchy darker regions. The brighter regions correspond to, it's really more of a, uh, this image is really more of a heat map, the bright, regions are hot, the dark regions are cool. And that difference in temperature also corresponds to a difference in density. So the bright parts are not so dense and the dark parts are dense. And this is structure that formed very early in the history of the universe. And this clumpiness that we see as cool, dense regions and bright, hot, not so dense regions, those collapse to form the clusters of galaxies that we see close to home. And this is actually the seed of what I call the large scale structure of the universe that we saw uh, midway through the program. So this baby picture is kind of uh, uh, a snapshot of what the universe looked like when it was very young and the structure that was imprinted very early in the history of the universe. And what's amazing is that these bright parts are only about one part in 100,000 times brighter than the dim parts. So this is a very high contrast image. We've cranked up the contrast to show the variance. But in fact, it's just a tiny fluctuation in the temperature and density of the early universe that leads to the formation of structure, the clumps and clusters of galaxies that we see close to home. So this is a really kind of cool, kind of big picture and a way I like to end this program. So that said, I think one thing I do want to do before we head home is just point out uh, one thing that's a little confusing here because it, and I've even referred to Earth and our solar system being at the center of this image. And I need to know that that's not because we're at the center of the universe. It's like those fingers of God I mentioned earlier. The reason the clusters of the galaxies all kind of point back to us on Earth is because we're the ones making the observations. Similarly, when we look at this model, we appear in this bright center, not because we're the center of the universe, but because we're the ones making the observations. So we're at the center of this and the here and the now, and this three-dimensional model is a model in space and time of the universe that we observe around us. So with that heady thought, let me go. Go ahead and plow back. So far, it's always recovered. So with any luck, there we go. Uh, we're going to keep uh, moving down closer to home. Those individual points representing uh, galaxies uh, relatively close by uh, will kind of whiz past us here. We'll zoom back down into our own Milky Way galaxy. I faded down the radio sphere, but we're kind of heading back in toward our own solar system. Here are those amazing extrasolar planets, those other planetary systems uh, that, um, that we see uh, relatively close to home. Thousands of planets in orbit around other stars, some of which uh, might be planetary systems that harbor life, but we have not yet discovered any evidence for life. And now I'll just kind of put the gas pedal down to get us back to our own solar system. We'll head back to our own third rock from the sun, our own home planet Earth. 
to basically where we started the program, looking at our own home planet with the map of uh, the clouds and the activity on our, on our planet's surface and atmosphere. Uh, still missing a bit of the, uh, the data from earlier today, uh, but revealing that, in fact, what we've been looking at so far is a collection of data uh, assembled into this three-dimensional universe that we can pilot through, describe, and share uh, together. So that's our program for this afternoon. Uh, just as a final note, uh, first of all, if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask them. I can try to address them here at the end. Um, but also, as I mentioned, we have, we've we been showing this in open space software. Uh, well, I think we've already shared a link to be able to download the software. But you can also, um, we have a survey if you have a chance to fill that out to let us know what you think about this, these ideas and the software and the program. We'd appreciate your input. And finally, I just want to mention that this is our last program of this exact type. You should definitely stay tuned on the Facebook Planetarium page, uh, Morrison Planetarium Facebook page, uh, to, uh, to keep track of what our next steps will be. But we're reopening Morrison Planetarium. Uh, this week. And because of that, we're going to change this up a little bit. If you come back to the Open Space YouTube channel next week, you'll be able to watch a simulcast of the same kind of tour that I gave you today from Morrison Planetarium. So live from the Morrison Planetarium uh, with a moderator, who will probably be me, answering questions that come up during the course of the trip. Unfortunately, we won't be able to take requests to take you to specific locations in the universe because you'll be listening in on the same show and seeing the same show that our audiences in Morrison Planetarium here in San Francisco will be experiencing. So we're trying out this simulcast to share Morrison Planetarium with the rest of the world. Again, 4.30 in the afternoon uh, Pacific time on Wednesdays. We'll be doing that all the time to share more of open space, more astronomy, and to answer your questions in chat. Uh, so definitely, if you come to the open space YouTube page next week, uh, YouTube channel next week, you'll be able to check it out. Check, check, check us out on the Facebook, Morrison Planetarium Facebook page, because we're trying to figure out exactly where this is going to land, uh, but there'll be more information about where to see us next week. Thanks for joining us, and hope you have uh, the rest of a really great day.